make sure you follow protocol with regards to Inspector General uh, Sum. But it's those cases where, you know, it's, you know, there have been many cases that have been reported. Um, and years ago, when I first started training, it was in the Midwest. There were families that made, say, $150,000 but put $15,000 on the fastener, you know. Just left off a couple zeros. Um, so um, knowing that, okay, by doing this, we're going to get, you know, need base A. You know, you learn the system, you know. Uh, or just leave off, you know, stuff. Or add family members, you know, like, where do they come from, you know. Um, so, I uh, mean, that's one of the things you have to verify, you know, household size. So they're counting any and everybody. They're counting pets, you know, it's part of the household size. Even though your pets are, you know, they're costly, you know, but they can't be counted in household size, you know, for these purposes, okay? Um, so again, fraudulent uh, information. So hopefully you never have to report any information, but that's what that's for here. And hopefully your policy procedures has something in writing. If that happens, you know, what's the protocol? And, this, and these are things you might want to check with your school. Uh, again, to, to see what we do on the AM campus. Comes question. Okay. I said earlier, it used to be, you know, sort of standard as to these are things you're required to verify. We have five things we have to verify. Most aid administrators need like the back of their hand. Those things never change. Basically, it's just household size, memory college, AGI, taxes paid, and untaxed income. Now, you know, some of those things are still there, but they, you know, added some things, you know, you know, high school graduation and those kind of things that you have to verify. So now, instead of having those five standard things, the department uh, does or can, they, it's subject to change yearly um, in regards to what you're required to verify. They will uh, notify students schools in the public register. Uh, typically, that comes out around July of every year, so like last July, July 2014. They did issue out to the um, aid administrators the items that are going to be required to verify for 15, 16, okay, for the upcoming award year. Uh, the department does um, provide that to schools. Uh, then you are required at that time to change or update your policies, not change them, and not write them if they're already written. Update your current policy to go with what's coming up with the next academic year, 15, 16. So again, the regulations can or are subject to change each year as to what items schools are required to verify. Sometimes it's status quo, they keep it safe, and then sometimes they may um, add something or delete something, right? Currently, you know, when you're verifying, you're looking at prior year, you know, so for the 15, 16 application, what tax return was used, or it's gonna be used? 2014, right? So that's prior year. The department does have any regulations, they could say, let's look at prior, prior year which would be, you know, the 13th. So again, and some schools, are, some new agents are probably do that. Because uh, if you look at prior, prior year, they're going to be more likely to have that tax return already done. You know, because right now you got student groups, well, parents are still doing their taxes. You know, you got to April 15, I haven't done mine yet. But you got to April 15 to get your taxes done. So you have something that's a little bit more, you know, I guess, complete or valid to use there. Um, but there's been this discussion about prior prior year um, hasn't come out come to pass yet. But for the most part, you look at the prior year, uh, and the department does tell you which items you're going to be verifying. So the guidance uh, that is provided uh, has been provided 15, 16 inches here on the slides. There, it was published um, June 25, 2014, and that told eight administrators what you're going to be required to verify for the 15, 16 um, award year. Two good uh, publications that I would recommend you read. Um, they make sure your dear colleague letters, um, anything to the federal register that you have, you guys keep abreast as to uh, what's happening as far as any regulations and changes. Hopefully, you guys have a staff meeting on some of this stuff on a regular basis as well. So, that was an overview of you know who's required to verify and, and such. And, and how the department determines, you know, tells the schools or notify you to be verified. How many, how many, you guys know, like, on a, if you had an ICER or SAR, what on that ICER or SAR, other than the verbiage and the language in there, what tells you that students have been verification? What's that? The C flag. The C flag, and then what's, what's usually beside the ICER? I think it's still there. Is it still there, Sean? Okay. What's usually besides the, the EFC? What's that? Yeah. So asterisk, yeah, an asterisk. So, so you, if you have ICERs or SARS, uh, ICERs, you know, electronically SAR and paper, uh, 
beside the student's EFC, you can't say about EFC, right? Respect the family contribution. So beside the EFC, if there's an asterisk beside it, that means that student is selected for education, okay? And also there's some language in the text of that student's ICER as well. Um, so they one time they tried to take that little asterisk away and it was really confusing to the administrator. Um, so if the asterisk is there, that means that student is subject to verification uh, by the Department of Ed, okay? So for 15, 16, students have an asterisk on the ESC, they're subject to verification. The department recently provided to schools what they call verification tracking flags, uh, V1 through V6. Now V2 is not used this current year. Uh, there wasn't used uh, the previous year there as well. Um, so that one was one I think it was only for if they were received uh, SNAP or uh, the SNAP benefit there. Uh, and that's basically AFPC, uh, those type of things there. <coughs> so these are your tracking groups, you have your standard group, and that's going to look at students that are, you know, based on those as the department has that are prone as far as high risk models. Uh, so it's your standard group. We're, go we're going to go over, you know, these to see what you're looking for to verify for each group, okay? Um, and then V2, you won't see any V2s for this particular award year. V3 is, as you see, your child support paid verification group. Um, and these are students that are falling under that child support criteria where something based on what they reported is triggered that we may want to verify this child support has been received, not as paid, but that's received. And then the custom verification group, that should be four. And those we're looking at, that might be some uh, issue with identity there, um, uh, child support paid. Uh, with identity, we think we're talking about um, their high school and also uh, looking at making sure there's not been any identity death there. But this is definitely the person that's applying for this, um, that's making application. And then you have your aggregate um, verification group there, and then your household resource verification. This one just came about, I think it was last award year, uh, the V6, and they're looking at the income that's in the household. Uh, so if you have a low income, if you have a large number of household members reported, they want you to school of families to verify now, how are you guys living? You got six people in the household and two thousand dollars. Or you know, that's been, you know, that's not being realistic. But really low income, but lots of people in the household. So now you gotta remember how are we living off that low income? You know, it's because, you know, we got, you know, this rich uncle there or something, else. but you there's students and families are having to actually verify how they're living um, off that income when it's such a low income. So they have to report all the additional untaxed income um, there. Okay. So for your V1, that's the first group there. The V1. Let's kind of dive and look at them real quick. With your V1, you're looking at the items you have to verify. You have the ABI, which is just the gross income, uh, taxes paid, like I said, not taxes withheld. And that's just looking at the right line item there. Because a lot of students say they take us on the W-2, and we know that's the taxes withheld, right? But on the tax return, I want to say on the 1040, it's like line 56, somewhere on that on that back page there. You're looking at taxes paid, not taxes withheld. So when you're verifying, you want to make sure that you're looking at the right line item, uh, taxes paid, not taxes withheld. That's what you want to look at. And then nine out of ten times when there's a mistake there, you probably put taxes withheld. Okay. Uh, untaxed portion of IRA deductions, uh, IRA distribution, excuse me, uh, and then your IRA deductions and payments uh, and education credits. So these are things you're actually looking to verify for your E1 filers, okay? And so the department tells you what you're required to verify, then they tell you what's acceptable documentation for those students as well. So you see here, um, if they do, again, if we were doing a roll your sleeves, you know, do verification, we would talk more about the IRS data retrieval. Basically, when you, when, as you guys know, when families apply for financial aid, they do the FAFSA. They are they have the option of using data retrieval tool. Data retrieval tool. It's not a requirement that students and families use that. We, you, you should strongly encourage them to do that in your, all of your publications, especially if they're selected verification. If they use the data retrieval tool and they get the O2, the Golden Goose O2 code, and they don't go back and change anything, then you would not have to get the uh, data transcript for that student, I mean the tax transcript. Because if they use the data retrieval, if they give the O2 code back, and they don't make any changes, again, this is repeating it for emphasis here, 
then you would not be required, if there's slave verification, you would not be required to request that tax transcript. Because you, you, that means that they use it, it matched, it's good, everything was good. Again, but it's only if you get the OT, you know. And so you, um, I'm not sure, I don't think we go into detail of the OT codes here in this particular presentation. Um, but if you have that, then you, it's again, it's a, it's a win win. You're not required to get that uh, tax transcript at that time. But let's say this, that's why, and that's why you have, that's why we have that first. So this is documentation required. So if you have this, most of your verification is done for that particular student. Of course, you got to do household size and those kind of things there. But as far as the tax document stuff, if you get the OT code, you don't need that tax document. But let's say they didn't do use that, or they made a change, you know, and now it's not an O2 anymore. Then you have to get the tax transcript at that time, okay, to verify that student. And the department does allow um, for alternate documentation if the transcript is not available. And it's very rare that it would not be available if they actually filed a return, okay? Uh, and then let's say if they did an amendment to the return or they have foreign tax returns, you see that on the slide. Uh, those would be reasons you could, could not either use their retrieval or get a tax transcript, and then the department does allow for um, alternate documentation. And again, that's the you know, small, that's a small percentage of students that you have to go that that to that way to verify the students file. Okay. In addition to verifying the um, income or information from the tax return, uh, you're looking at the income earned from uh, work there, and when you verify that particular line item. Um, the Susie Duke's assigned statement, um, certifying what they worked. Uh, the individual has not filed. And this is for a student who actually did file a return. So the previous slide, you know, you would get the income from work off the tax transcript if they actually filed a return. But if they did not file a return, then you're going to use a signed statement certifying that they um, has not filed. And the key, what some schools are missing here, they would get they had not filed. But they also not required to file. That should be a part of that statement as well. And that's the key thing that the auditor would be looking for. Not that they didn't file, but they were not required to file uh, that tax return. So if they were not required to file, didn't file, then they have a list of sources of income that they have for that tax year, uh, and then a copy of any W-2s that were attached to that source of income, okay, if they have those. Uh, it could have been the, the odd jobs or whatever, and they don't have them actual tax, you know, or actual W-2, but you should have, uh, we'll get to verification worksheets, we should have a document or something where they will actually contest, the same where they get earn the monies from, you know, Uncle Joe's restaurant, or so what, something like, if it was a family kind of thing. But again, if they had W-2s, they were probably, probably going to copy of those um, as well, okay? And those are things you can use for documentation for income or for work if they did not file. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So let's say you have a student that said they did not file a return, or they said they did file when they were not required to file. Okay. But let's say you question that, and just don't tell me you have to do this. If the institution questions, they claim that the tax filer um, uh, was maybe required to file, then you must require that them to get. A, this new form now, this is new, a verification of non-filing letter. And they would get that from the IRS. So you got some students who look at it and say, well, I think, I think they maybe should have filed. Or, you know, if you, if you question, and again, you're only required to do this if you question that they, you know, should have filed a return, okay? And you can get this um, at the Get Transcript Online uh, site as well. And with this one, you can get it there, or they can actually do smell it in with the 4506T or checking box 7. Um, as you see there on the slide, this is not available uh, until after June 15. So if, it's, if you do question a student's filing status, then that's going to delay processing the even more. Uh, the verification is going to delay it anyway, you know, unless, you know, unless you're really on it. But let's say you have a non-tax filer, you question whether they should file or not based on what they provided in the, uh, <coughs> the record, then you are required to do this step. And some schools are like, I just won't question anybody. But we're not saying don't question anybody. We say, but if you legitimately look at something, it's conflicting information in their file, and you question that, then you are to do this next step here. And just know that you know, at this time of the processing year, it's going to delay it because uh, that letter, 
that are available to see until June 15th. It just means that you won't, they won't get an award letter, you know, but you can, it's going to be more accurate um, data because you'll get this information there. And this is going to uh, confirm whether they were required to file or not. And they had this in process last year. I'm not sure if any of you guys worked for that process. Uh, have you guys ever had to get one of these already? You may not know at this point. The other thing that you're required to verify is the number in household and the number in college. Um, a lot of times students will forget to put their name on the form, you know, as far as, you know, household size, but you want to make sure that uh, it has the sign statement or if you guys have institutional worksheets, the department on, for 15-16 is not going to be providing the uh, verification worksheet uh, they have done in, in, you know, past years. So a lot of schools have developed their own institutional verification worksheet that captures the same data that the department was capturing on, on theirs. Uh, you can just take one and sort of just, you know, copy it and sort of copy and paste it and make it work for your school. Uh, but you're required to uh, get the household size. And we see, when we look at documentation, it's a signed statement, signed statement. And you could just have them give you this as a signed statement. You're not required to use a verification worksheet. It makes it a lot easier, it's more standard, you know, you can say this is your verification worksheet for independent or dependent student, and the file looks, you know, consistent. Or you just have statements all over the file, you know, but I think, you know, uh, it looks a little, it's more cleaner for our audit trail if we have, everybody has the same verification worksheet that you've developed by your institution, instead of just having this summer speak. You can just say a student, bring me a signed statement verifying these items. You know, they bring it in, however they choose to bring it in. Or you can say, this is the verification worksheet that we have. You know, capture all the data there, have them sign it. Any documentation needs to be attached to it. Uh, to me, that's a, you know, a cleaner file for an auditor. You don't want to have any red flags in your file for an auditor. You know, keep it as clean as possible. But as soon as you see, you know, an audit, I've been on the auditing side as well. As soon as you see something that's just ding, 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 you know, and you open up a can of worms. So again, keep it clean, you know, so the files are consistent there. So instead of doing a signed statement, which you can, you know, capture it on, on one document. You want to get um, household size there. And these, these are the exclusions. The rest of there, things you're required to verify, then there's some exclusions there. So you would not be required to verify household size if it's a dependent student, a household size report is two, and the parent is unmarried. Or it's the household size is three if they are married, okay? So basically, they understand that if it's a dependent student, and the household size is two, and you've already said that it's un unmarried, then they're assuming it, okay, it's a student and a parent. You know, so those are, again, that's an exclusion, but most schools are gonna say, okay, if I'm verifying the file, I'm not gonna sure verify everything. So we're just letting you know the department says to bar, saying, okay, this is one thing you wouldn't have to do. Uh, but most schools <coughs> are you know, going to verify that entire file. It makes sense, you got the file open, might as well verify it, right? Because uh, something could happen later, you know. But this, this to me, only gives a school like a little, I guess, an out for auditing purpose. Like, so let's say somebody missed that one right there, you know. And you can say, well, it was two people, a parent, student, you know, they can't write you up for that because you, you know, well, tend to be required to do it. But again, keeping things consistent, you know, most schools are going to verify. If you're going to verify one data element, you're going to probably verify all of it, okay? It's just making you aware of the exclusions, okay? You want to verify that they're in college, again, sign statement, or again, you're going to capture this all in one thing. Um, if it's, that's an exclusion there, it's not required to verify that if it's one. So you know it's going to be a student. But again, you're going to verify it because you're going to verify the entire file, okay? Uh, name, and with this one, you're going to look at the name of the household members that are attending college at least um, half time. So you verify the household size first. The number in college should never be more than household size, right? Uh, it makes sense. So you want to make sure that household size, number in college, and so these people have to be in that number, right? And they have to be at least that time. It's common sense stuff, but these are things that are oftentimes missed in verification. Whether they, the person was verified by just didn't know, or they just rushed to the file. Now these are one of those procedures where you don't want to rush the file, because it really determines how much aid is going to receive, okay? Sean, are you guys doing PJ in this training, professional judgment? Yes, that's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, yes. I, the only thing I would say as far as professional judgment and verification, and I'm sure the training will tell you that tomorrow, verification is required. You have to do verification, you know, uh, on students that are selected for verification by the Department of Ed. When they talk about PJ tomorrow, professional judgment is one of those things that is optional, not required to do. Uh, most schools do it. 
you know, if you want to have any constant seizures to do that. And basically, professional judgment, you're just using your judgment to 